Okay, so we will get started with session four now. Um, our first speaker in session four is Dr. Carrie Jordan. She is the executive director of The Carpentries, a nonprofit project that teaches foundational coding and data science skills. I'm thrilled to have um, Carrie with us here today. CMU Libraries has been members of The Carpentries for the last couple of years now. So we hold these workshops regularly and they're incredibly popular. Um, we always have a very long waiting list. And so I'm just really thrilled to hear her talk about her work at The Carpentries. And I will give it over to you, Carrie. Thanks, Melanie. And hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Carrie Jordan, Executive Director for The Carpentries. And I, I really am so happy to be here to address you today. The title of my talk is, I want to dance with somebody, how personal values drive inclusion in open science communities. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's my pleasure to share my thoughts and experiences with you in hopes that you'll leave empowered to advocate for inclusion. I wanna begin with the end in mind and deliver a call to action to each and every one of you. Write this question down and consider it as you engage in this talk. And that question is, how do your personal values align with your work in open science? Today, I'm really going to open up and be transparent with you about a few things, including my thoughts on the open science space and feeling like an imposter the role that research and data plays in my life and what I've learned about building personal values through my work at the Carpentries. We'll talk about meaningful equity and finally circle back to that call to action that I gave you at the beginning. At some point I may burst into song, so just be prepared for that. <laughs> and hopefully throughout the talk, we'll have some fun as well. So I thought about my life and where data played a significant role. I was born in Detroit, Michigan in the US, what some would consider a big city, and I was born in the 1980s. During a time when Detroit was at or near the top of unemployment, poverty per capita, and infant mortality, my parents brought me into this unpredictable world. In the 80s, Detroit became notorious for crime and was repeatedly dubbed the arson capital of America, the murder capital of America, and the most dangerous city in America. But for me, it was not all doom and gloom. I remember growing up in this house. I remember backyard barbecues. I remember slumber parties with my cousins. I remember all of my uncles living in our basement at one point or another. I remember making snow angels outside in the winter and jumping through the fire hydrant in the summer. I also remember learning that opening the fire hydrant was illegal, but I digress. <laughs> I remember Christmas lights and Thanksgiving turkeys and the first time my mom added baby carrots to our spaghetti. That was a really interesting experiment. I remember loving this house. I remember loving my family. I remember loving living in Detroit. But I do remember some things that are on the not so positive side. I remember dropping to the floor as gunshots rang in the new year. I remember having our home broken into during Christmas and having all our Christmas gifts stolen. I remember my brother being arrested because he fit the description of an armed robber. I remember how difficult it was to plan celebrations with my parents because they divorced when I was three years old. All of these anecdotes are data points. And if we were to trust this data, a Detroiter like me, born in the 80s, would presently live below the poverty line and work in either accommodation or food services. If we trust this data, a Detroiter like me, born in the 80s, would presently rely on federally funded programs to support themselves. But there was another plan for me and that plan began with these two, Myling and Albert. My parents taught me to work diligently to get good grades. I played sports, I sang in the choir. I did everything that I needed to do to get into engineering school. About a 10 hour drive north of Detroit, there's a small town in the Upper Peninsula called Houghton, Michigan. 
And that's where I went to school for my undergraduate and master's degrees. Michigan Technological University was a place I never thought I'd end up. I was one of the only women, one of the only women and people of color in most of my classes. But I was determined to do well because I got accepted. I got accepted into engineering school. I was invited to the party. Now, after earning a bachelor's and master's degree in mechanical engineering, I decided to pursue my PhD, but I wanted to address the fact that there weren't enough people who looked like me in the field. So I switched my focus from mechanical engineering to engineering education. And that's how I learned about many of the techniques that the Carpentries uses to teach workshops and build community. I earned a master's in education and a PhD in engineering education from the Ohio State University. But despite all of that that I just shared with you, I still felt like an imposter. I remember the first time a colleague introduced me to someone looking to learn about open science. And in their introduction, they used the word experts. I was totally thrown off by this because at the time I'd only been working in this space for about six months and I could barely import a CSV into R. My research practices were horrible. I had no idea what a workflow was. I had never heard of the term reproducibility and I was storing my data in multiple formats all over the place. And this person introduced me as an expert. What? No way. In my own words, imposter syndrome is the belief that your success is illegitimate and that at some point you'll be found out. I was working for an organization that develops and teaches lessons on the fundamental data skills needed to conduct research. But my own research practices had been horrible. And any moment now, they were going to find out. The day I realized that I wasn't an imposter in this space was the day that I received this note from a Carpentries community member. It reads, thank you for letting me help with the assessment process and driving our community forward with data. You see, what makes an expert isn't that the individual knows everything. Having comprehensive or authoritative knowledge is nothing if you aren't creating an environment where others feel comfortable contributing to the work. For this individual, I had done just that. I no longer feel like an imposter and I have the Carpentries to thank for that. The Carpentries vision is to be the leading inclusive community teaching data and coding skills. Through our programs, we are working to dismantle the broken power structures and resource distribution that negatively impact marginalized communities around the world. We are empowering diverse groups of people to work with data and code, but these ideals didn't just fall out of the sky. The Carpentries has built its foundation to build global capacity with values that have and will continue to shape the way we grow inclusive computational communities. I'm passionate about this organization because those values align with my personal values. At the Carpentries, we build community through the lens of equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Now, those are terms that we kind of throw around often. So I, I really wanna dig into each one and share with you what I mean. Equity is about creating opportunities for equal access to and participation in programs that are capable of closing participation gaps in your community. For example, this image illustrates the difference between equality and equity. Equality is about sameness. It promotes justice by giving everyone the same thing. But it can only work if everyone starts from the same place. In this example, equality only works if everyone is the same height. Equity is about fairness. It's about making sure people have access to the same opportunities. And sometimes our differences or our history can create barriers to participation. So we must first achieve equity before we can enjoy equality. Now, inclusion is the active, intentional, and ongoing engagement of diverse people and communities. 
Advocating for inclusion increases awareness, content knowledge, and understanding of the ways that we interact within and change community. We have put so much attention on diversity in open science, but diversity does not equal inclusion. And let me share with you what I mean by that. One of my favorite quotes is by Verna Myers. She says, diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. Now, how would you feel? You put your best foot forward. You worked so hard that there's no way that you don't get asked to the party. You put your makeup on, guys, you got a nice haircut. You get invited to the party, but when you get there, you're standing in the corner the whole night because nobody asked you to dance. You know the song, right? I wanna dance with somebody. I wanna feel the heat with somebody. With somebody who loves me. I know you were singing along with me. <laughs> Inclusion is more than inviting people who don't look like you to the conversation or to the workshop or to the conference. It's ensuring that when they get there, they're able to interact and contribute in the ways that are meaningful to them. Diversity is situated around a deficit model. We need to get women, we need to get LGBT, we need to include all of these people, right? But inclusion promotes an equity paradigm. Now, accessibility refers to program and process design and implementation that offers multiple avenues for access and participation. In other words, accessibility is the usability of a product, service, environment or facility by people with the widest range of possibility. Now, let me take a pause here for a moment so that we all can do a pulse check. In the beginning, I asked a question. How do your personal values align with your work in open science? I shared my personal values through stories about my journey to data, and I shared anecdotally the values that the Carpentries instills and ones that we were founded on in terms of equity, inclusion, accessibility, and how they inform our decision making. Now it's time for you to reflect. Open science is better served by having diverse people with the skills to use data to address the questions that are important to them. In your role, your values inform how you do your work. I encourage us all to work together to provide easily accessible resources for people who are unfamiliar with the tools and technology that you work with on a daily basis. How can we do that? What if there were greater diversity in the languages spoken where we teach and interact? How can we recognize and appreciate the different cultural norms that exist around data, programming, teaching, and volunteering in different regions? How can we recognize and value the various types of contributions that we see in open science? How can we work with existing organizations to reach broader communities rather than building or reinventing our own networks? How can we authentically work with broader communities rather than approach our work with a we're doing it for them mentality? We won't be able to answer these questions or solve these issues immediately, but I do want you to realize that your story, your values, and your contributions matter. And if we're going to drive inclusion in open science, we can only go further when we go together. Thank you so much, and I will answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Carrie. Um, if anyone wants to throw up a hand in the participant panel, or you can send me a question in the chat, and we'll just give us a minute to see what questions pop up. I think I missed my three minute. I think I made it. Oh, I, <laughs> I, I didn't give you a three minute warning. <laughs> yeah, we've been doing okay on time today. So we're just um, being a little bit more informal about it than we thought we might have to be. Okay, I think I did see a hand. Or I saw an applause symbol from Joe. Thanks, Joe. Um, 
Okay, we do have a question from Carly. And Carly, please feel free. Why don't you just um, actually unmute yourself and ask Carrie directly. Hi, Carrie, I really enjoyed your talk and I've been to data carpentry workshops before and have really enjoyed them. Um, I was curious um, if you could discuss some of the barriers that differ that are preventing people from getting into coding, but that maybe differ across different populations. Yes, absolutely. You know, I think we're shifting from the science people are over here doing science and the programmers are over here doing programming and eventually they'll come together. More and more we're seeing, especially now we're seeing, you have to have at least some basic knowledge about programming in order to participate in many, uh, whether it's a postdoc, whether it's um, a, a job in industry. And so what we're seeing for novice learners coming in, the, the biggest barrier that we're seeing is language. As, and surprisingly, even in the States where, you know, many people do speak English in the States. However, the way that some of the documentation is written or the textbooks around learning coding, it doesn't really translate to how the individual has learned other subjects and other fields. And so there's a lot of jargon when you're first learning programming. It's like you should already have a prerequisite knowledge of all of this terminology. And so that that's kind of what shy or turns people away from programming. They feel like they can't learn programming unless they already know all of this terminology. And that's, that's just not true. And that's one of the things that we try our best to do in the carpentries is kind of teach the most useful thing first so that you can get confidence. If you've written a script to do one thing, you can write it to do another thing. And so eliminating a lot of the terminology that, that kind of gets you know lost in the code and focusing on here is how you do the thing without knowing all of the, you know, the complicated words that go along with it. And then of course you can learn those things later. So I think that's one of the major barriers is language in general and some of the assumptions that you need to know the terminology before even opening you know, a Jupyter notebook or the command line. That's really interesting. What do you, so I work in a lab where there, there are a couple people learning code and English is not their native language. Like what can you, what could I do to help them in their, their learning journey? Oh, I love that question. Yes. So actually I have a resource that I want to share. When I, when I finish talking, I'm going to put it in the chat for the moderators and then you can share. Yeah. We actually just started a project called Glossario and it is an open source repository of translations of terminology and all of the community has been contributing to it, contributing um, translations in German, French, Spanish, Korean and a couple of other uh, languages. And so everyone can go into the the glossario uh, repository look at the definitions of the term and even suggest suggest other translations of those definitions and then we're using that in our workshops to kind of you know reduce that barrier so that's one resource that i definitely want to share with you in case you want to share it or even you know contribute some language to it as well um and then the the next thing that i would i guess recommend if there are language barriers practice problems, having multiple practice problems and trying to contextualize the, the problems within the context of the individuals that you're working with helps a lot. And having them kind of speak back to you what they hear, because a lot of times when we teach things, we come from the perspective of the instructor. I talk about, I talk a, a lot of bit about, a lot about this in uh, training. We have teaching objectives, but we don't focus on learning objectives. So a lot of times as instructors, we say, I need to cover all these things, but we don't consider what do they actually need to walk away with. And so if we're thinking about 
it from that perspective. What do I want them to be able to walk away with? It should help, hopefully help us, you know, teach those things, the most useful things first, and then have them kind of regurgitate it back to you. Okay, what I understand is that you would like for me to do this, or this this command does this, you know, kind of have, have them talk it back to you um, to make sure that they have the understanding. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much um, for the question, Carly, and thank you, Carrie, for the talk. And also, I just wanted to share another comment. Ania said that she doesn't have a question, but loves the talk. Just wanted to pass that along. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, I'm a huge fan of the carpentries and really love the inclusive approach. I was very intimidated by programming for many years as a researcher, so um, it just really speaks to me. Um, okay, so we will move on, but we will have more time to ask Carrie questions during the panel. So we'll queue up our next speaker. Our next speaker is Justin Kitsis. Hi, Justin. Hi. All right. Great. Does that look good over there? Yes, it does. And I'll do a brief intro for you, and then I will sure. let you take it over. Okay. Um, Dr. Justin Kitsis is an assistant professor of biological sciences at the University of Pittsburgh. His research broadly examines how human alteration of natural habitat impacts species abundance and diversity at large spatial scales. Um, and he's also authored this book that looks like he's going to talk about the practice of reproducible research. Thank you very much for joining us. Sure. All right. Thanks very much, Melanie. Uh, so it's a pleasure to see you all today, virtually at least. Um, as Melanie said, my name is Justin Kitzes. I'm just up the road here at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, and our lab there, our lab's research focuses at the intersection of ecology, conservation, and data science. Uh, we do a lot of work these days in particular with machine learning models for bioacoustic analysis uh, in the field. And although that is our main area right now, uh, I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, instead, I'm going to uh, talk about a book uh, here called The Practice of Reproducible Research, uh, which I edited uh, with a few colleagues back when I was at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science, uh, which Sierra Martinez knows very well. She's our next speaker. Um, so my main goal today uh, is going to be to share some of the take home messages from this book about the practical aspects of doing academic research in a reproducible manner. And to be quite frank, much of which was heavily inspired by the philosophies and work of the Carpentries. Um, and as I go, I'll also try to throw out uh, some good quotes from some of the authors that we can argue about later on. Uh, so this book was published by UC Press in 2017. You can get a copy at all of the usual places, of course. Um, but at the risk of losing your attention for the rest of the talk, uh, this is actually the URL at which you can find the complete text of the book uh, freely available online. That's practice reproducible research in the imperative command form uh, in the URL. So what will you find there um, in this book that we worked on? So the initial genesis was to, of the idea was to collect a set of case studies in reproducible research. So that is very concrete examples of exactly how different researchers went about trying to conduct their research in a reproducible manner. Uh, we actually gave each contributor a template to use in writing these case studies so that they're very consistent across chapters, which helps to compare. Uh, in each of these chapters, we asked each contributor to think about just the last project that they worked on, paper, software, product, presentation, and describe the workflow that they used to do that work and in what specific ways they tried to ensure that their work would be reproducible. And then around this set of case studies, we wrote several chapters describing reproducibility in general, uh, providing some basic practices and summarizing the characteristics of the various case studies. Uh, as an aside, for those who might be interested, we did write this entire book collaboratively using GitHub and it was served using Gitbook until very recently when the interface changed. Um, but before I go any further into the, um, into the book and the case studies, I wanna step back and define exactly what we mean by reproducibility uh, in the context of this particular book. So of course, there's no single definition of reproducibility, uh, but we did have several contributors define the characteristics of reproducibility in an operational fashion for the purpose of the book. So for example, Philip Stark from UC Berkeley uh, wrote the preface to the book. 
uh, which he titled Nullius in Verba, which is the motto of the Royal Society from 1660, and translates roughly to take nobody's word for it. And Phil kind of drew a line from this basic principle of science to show me rather than trust me to our sometimes failures to do this in the modern day science enterprise. So he said in his chapter specifically, I would argue if a paper does not provide enough information to assess whether its results are correct, it is something other than science. Consequently, I think scientific journals and the peer review system must change radically. Referees and editors should not bless work they cannot check because the authors did not provide enough information. And scientific journals should not publish such work. If researchers do not make their code available, there's little hope of ever knowing what was done to the data, much less assessing whether it was the right thing to do. In the chapter after that, Roca, Marwick, and Steneva follow up on that. This was actually a reference to another paper that defined reproducibility a little more technically uh, as the ability of a researcher to duplicate the results of a prior study using the same materials as were used by the original investigator. And then finally, from the introduction, which I wrote for the book, we use this very short and somewhat narrow operational definition with our, with our contributors. Research project is computationally reproducible if a second investigator can recreate the final reported results of the project, including key quantitative findings, tables, and figures, given only a set of files and written instructions. So from that sort of basic idea, we went forward to collecting these case studies. And as I mentioned, the set of 31 case studies is kind of at the heart of the book. And the idea was to create a collection or a sort of library of examples that readers could consult for examples and ideas that might be useful in their own work. And it turned out that there was a very general framework that crossed all of these submitted case studies uh, involving three parts, stages of data input, data processing, and data analysis. Now, in retrospect, this seems really obvious. I, I promise you it was not so easy to come up with this inductively when we were looking at the set of case studies to realize that they all did share this very similar structure. So as an example of what you might find in the book for the case studies, I'll just give an example of the case study that I contributed, um, which was on analyzing the spatial distribution of bat species based on recordings of their calls, similar to work that we still, research work we still do today in our lab. Uh, as in all of the case studies, Every case study starts with a figure and a description of a workflow that was used in this project. This is all of the pieces basically that have to be glued together in some particular way in order to make the research project happen. Aside from that or after that, every author then gives a description of pain points. And this is what were the most difficult aspects of making their research re reproducible. So for example, in my case study, I focused on in this particular project, an unavoidable need for two graphical closed source programs at different points in the pipeline, which had to be integrated in with all of the rest of the work that we were doing, as well as on issues with dependency management when we tried to share the software with other people. I'm actually gonna come back to these pain points in more detail in just a moment. And then finally, at the end, every author was asked uh, to talk about the benefits that they saw, why did they bother to do their research in a reproducible way, uh, and then some questions such as, what does reproducibility mean to you? What are the main benefits? What are the challenges, et cetera? So when it came time to think about synthesizing some common themes or takeaway points from across the case studies, we realized pretty quickly that the commonalities in what was successful uh, or what tools were used, for example, were nearly as interesting as the common reports about what was challenging or what actually did not work when people tried to make reproducible workflows. And so in terms of what stops reproducibility, we had two chapters by Huff, Ram, and Marwick who categorized the challenges to reproducibility into three main categories. And the first of these uh, categories is people. It's always people, always the problem. Many contributors specifically though, highlighted skill and knowledge gaps among collaborative teams with varying levels of expertise using particular tools. And we often think about coding in this respect, people with varying abilities to, to program, but this wasn't just coding that was raised. It was also things like platforms for collaborative manuscript editing, particularly the divide over using tech or not, um, ability or familiarity with open software, and even knowledge of open science, science principles more generally. And in that respect, Here's kind of a good quote from the Huff chapter. 
A scientist unwilling to disenfranchise their collaborators could certainly elect to use more widely used tools. However, the price is often paid in reproducibility when those widely used lowest common denominator tools conflict with reproducibility goals. This is especially the case with tools such as Microsoft Word, Excel, or MATLAB. And she goes on to describe other sort of tools with only graphical interfaces being a particular challenge. So that kind of leads into the second main category of challenges that people raised or brought up, uh, which is computers, maybe the obvious one, the seemingly the most obvious one. There were three specific areas that many people highlighted as problematic when trying to do reproducible research from this perspective. The first of these is dependency management, which is the art, use that word purposefully, and science of getting openly shared code running successfully on another machine. And the difficulty of this, of course, varies according to the complexity of the research pipeline and the particular platforms that are needed. Uh, the second is hardware availability um, with, of course, something specifically highlighted resources like HPC being particularly hard to access outside of a sort of in-group of experienced users. And finally, third, gaps in the pipeline between specific tools that are difficult to link together, particularly when some are proprietary or are only available with graphical interfaces. And then finally, the third sort of major category of challenges to reproducibility came from institutions. And first of these access restrictions on data, um, as we're all very aware, there is some data that for legal or ethical reasons simply cannot be openly shared in its original form that was used in the analysis. But the authors actually went beyond that sort of challenge to talk about the recommendation of a better setting of standards for scrubbed and representational data to help work around this. So even if you can't reproduce the exact results shown in a publication, you can at least examine the pipeline and see how the results were generated, even if you can't get the exact same one. And then second, the topic that was the perennial discussion back when I was in the, this Institute for Data Science was around incentives. And with some debate, to be fair, it was generally agreed by many of our contributors um, and many of the collaborators on the book, even larger, that reproducibility tends to be relatively mildly rewarded and irreproducibility tends to be relatively mildly punished. And the trouble is, of course, that doing irreproducible science is easier, at least in the short term, in that moment, because it's kind of the lazy way out. It requires less of you than going through the extra steps required to make your work reproducible. And it can thus be much faster at least in the short term, to work that way. And in a world that prioritizes fast and novel results that are rarely confirmed, this is a recipe for seeing a lot of irreproducible research. So as Ram and Marwick, traditional incentives in science prioritize highly cited publications of positive, novel, tidy results. The practice of enabling the reproducibility of those results to be assessed by making the code and data publicly available is not part of the traditional incentives of science. I think many of us recognize that. The question then becomes what needs to happen. And I'll leave you with a thought, possibly for discussion, about the difference between carrots and sticks. So carrots in reproducibility are things like the idea that if you are open with your data or code, you'll have more citations. People might use your data. They might cite your papers more often. This is a good thing. The idea of giving out badges, for example, this is a good thing. This is a carrot. And this is in contrast, though, to sticks. What are the sticks in reproducibility? Journal paper rejections, proposal rejections, and tenure rejections. And I will say that I believe personally, as I know many of my colleagues do, that we probably don't talk about sticks quite as much as maybe we should. I'll be quite honest, this has changed a fair amount since we started working on this book probably six or seven years ago. I think this conversation's advanced quite far, but I would just put out there that it is a lot easier to talk about carrots than it is to talk about sticks, but it's worth discussing the necessity to some degree of having sticks to force people to work in this kind of way. So I'll just conclude here with one final mention. Um, as I mentioned, this, we wrote this book while at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science, which was part of a network of three data science institutes that were supported by the Moore and Sloan Foundations a few years back. And these institutes have sort of uh, given birth to this larger organization called the Academic Data Science Alliance. 
uh, which is carrying on a lot of the work and ideas that came out of that early work at those three institutes. Uh, we just had an annual meeting last week, so you missed that, unfortunately. Um, but this community, I thought maybe people in this community might be interested in keeping an eye on this website for special interest groups, phone calls, uh, other events related to the themes of the conference today. And uh, so I'll just say thanks and um, looking forward to any questions or discussion. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Justin. Um, we've had um, the topic of lack of incentivization for reproducibility and data sharing come up a few times over the last couple of days. Um, I think the sticks aspect of it is um, perhaps new to that conversation for the event. Um, does anybody have any questions for Justin? You can um, send me a message in the chat or you can just raise your hand. I'm just scanning the participant window right now. We'll just give this a minute to let people type stuff out. Oh, we have a question from Alex. You can go ahead and unmute yourself, Alex. Um, yeah, as long as we're talking about sticks, um, I am curious to know what, where you think you would put the stick first, since um, the, uh, I mean, you know, one of the difficulties I think with introducing disincentives or you know, sort of enforcement into the system is how much technical difficulty mm -hmm. there still is around reproducibility. And so it's kind of like, you don't want to enforce on people something that they're really still struggling to do because the tools and things to do it aren't available. So yeah. where would you think would be sort of the first place to put enforcement, like yeah. in journals and funding? That's, that's a great question. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my answer almost by process of elimination, because where is it not, where is it very hard to do? One of the hardest places to do it is at the journals because it requires uh, extra effort and knowledge from the reviewers, which I think is honestly a lot to ask, to ask a reviewer who's, you know, it's already hard enough to find reviewers and to ask that we now need to find people who are going to try to re-execute all of the code needed to run this analysis, I think is a tall order. So at, at some level, I think that's a very difficult one. I also think promotion and review is a difficult place um, for exactly the reasons you raised. It's a very high stakes decision. Um, it's hard to criticize people for something they never learned how to do, even if the rest of their scholarship is very good. So in a sense, I'm going to answer a process of elimination that I would suggest considering the proposal review stage, um, because relative to the other two, well, not relative to promotion and, and tenure review, but there's already a lot of time spent on the process of reviewing proposals. So they are relatively deeply read and they are given in some sense to the best projects. And what are considered the best projects is that some discretion of the program officers and the reviewers. And so if there are offices, for example, at NSF who would decide that having even stronger reproducibility components than what are currently uh, included in, for example, data management plans made you the best proposal, um, that's an area that I think is maybe a little more conceivable than the other ones in terms of sticks. And again, since we've started working on this book, things have already moved in that direction to some extent. Cool, thanks. Great, thank you. Um, thank you for the question, Alex. And thanks, Justin, for the talk. I think at this point, we will save any remaining questions for Justin for the panel um, and queue up our final speaker of the symposium, final invited speaker. Uh, our last speaker is Sierra Martinez. So Sierra, if you are here, you can um, get your slides up on the screen. Okay, do you guys see my screen? Yes, and I'll just do a brief introduction and then hand it over to you. Um, Dr. Sierra Martinez is currently the research lead of biodiversity and environmental sciences at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science. Her research focuses on data intensive research projects that aim to understand how life on this planet evolves in reaction to the environment and climate. Um, she is a longtime open science advocate and has been involved in training for open data education and software. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting me to speak today with so many other um, inspiring open source advocates. So today I'm gonna to talk about some current work that really is the culmination of 
a lot of conversations I've had over the year on how reproducible science is performed. So it's a perfect, um, perfect way to go after Justin. So there's a deep disconnect in how scientists perform data intensive research projects and how we talk about it and further how we teach it. So while this is like a really dry title, um, what, I'm in, what I'm gonna talk about is really rooted in something exciting and that's a desire to create a faster, bigger and more inclusive community, um, community-based research in science. So a bit of background about myself. Um, I got my PhD in molecular biology uh, and I studied evolution. And for my PhD, I studied how DNA mechanisms regulate plant architecture. And then for my postdoc, I moved to flies and I was interested in genome evolution. So a lot of my work was within a smaller research group and my workflow was done alone. So while performing this work, I think this echoes a lot of people what they're saying. Um, they, I fell into data science and programming. So, and I really fell in love with it. And it's not because of the programming aspect. It's what I perceived as a way to create better science and it improved my research questions. So data science tools allow unprecedented an amount of reproducibility and when combined with open source practices and open science practices like open data, open code, open publishing, I saw a clear future of a scientific community allowing research to expand and combine their research um, like no other time. And a future in where we work in large teams to tackle the largest, most pressing research questions in science. Uh, so that is what I'm doing now. Um, I'm like I, she, like I was just introduced. Uh, I'm the lead of research at Biodiversity and Environmental Sciences at the Berkeley Institute of Data Science, or what we call BIDS. So in this role, I like I pursue answering really big questions that require multiple teams of researchers, like how does climate change affect life on this planet? These types of ambitious questions really rely on a bunch of multidisciplinary scientists getting all of their data together and integrating it across many, many scales. So this brings me to the question, how do scientists work together? And the short answer is computational reproducibility. And I have a, a deep fascination with this topic and an extensive background trying to teach computational reproducibility. Um, including a data carpentry workshop that I helped create. And I really approach this with empathy in mind um, for beginners who are trying to approach this. And I, again, I, I have to give credit to the carpentries for the empathetic um, nature. I really borrowed from learning and working with the carpentry. So a nod to Carrie and uh, the carpentries. It's really appropriate that we're in the same session. Um, so essentially, this is a really dense term for just being super organized is how you get computational organized, computational reproducibility achieved. Um, and it's being organized enough so that others can replicate your work. Then that's really how big team science can be performed. So why is teaching computational reproducibility so hard? So I find it really difficult to create <laughs> actual teaching material for teaching computational reproducibility. Um, and over the years, I've learned a few lessons and these have kind of been repeated over these last two talks. So one, uh, working openly and with reproducibility in mind, and I'm echo Justin here, it takes time and there's little incentive within academia. Two, every research project is extremely unique, including the skills and tools that you'll use for it, but also the people you work with their skills and tools and the community standards are not well defined. Furthermore, which I didn't list here, uh, a project evolves over time. So the standards evolve with the project. Um, the third is data analysis workflows get confounded with software development workflows. And these are very different workflows. Yes, there's lots of overlap between them, but and we can borrow a lot from what's known about software development workflows, but the terminology and, and jargon <laughs> that is used to describe this, we're using synonymous words, we're using analogous words that 
and it just gets really confusing really, really fast. So I also echo what Carrie was talking about. Um, so in light of that, I've been using the word workflow um, and pipeline. Uh, these two are often used analogously. Um, so I'm gonna just tell you the difference between and how I'm gonna use them. So a pipeline is a series of processes and data analysis, and it's usually linear in nature and can be programmatically defined. And the key thing here is that it's automated by a computer. So steps can be usually described in relation to inputs and outputs. And workflow is a series of processes involving how humans navigate through this system of data analysis. And it's a mixture of code, machine automation, documentation, and human intervention. And a lot of times this is not linear in nature. So we do stuff, we learn stuff, but then we don't teach that stuff. This is a, a profound quote from Sarah Stout, um, a colleague of mine at the Berkeley Institute of Data Science. Well, now she just moved on to, to Smith College, but um, this is really at the heart of the problem. We all develop our workflows and analyze our data pretty much siloed in our own, in our own work. Even many times it's siloed within the team that we work in. And we'll talk to our team about the results of our research, but we really don't talk to them about the decisions we make for designing reproducible workflows. So if we're not defining what a workflow is and how to design workflows to ourselves or to our small team, how are we going to teach the next generation of researchers? So these concerns were at the forefront of my mind when I started at BIDS as a postdoctoral fellow. Um, me and Justin actually didn't overlap, but I've gotten to know him <laughs> over the years, um, which again, this is a nod to, to Justin because that book that was written was before my time, um, but it really informed the culture of BIDS. So I had these thoughts in mind and we, we have a lot of conversations of that at the Berkeley Institute of data, for Data Science and um, myself and two other researchers, Sarah Stout and Valerie Vasquez, uh, a statistician and an environmental biologist, um, we decided to get together and go beyond defining a reproducible workflow to creating a strategy for designing a workflow. So we just released this preprint uh, and we just got really positive reviews back. So hopefully it's gonna be published soon. Um, principles for data analysis workflow. So the goals of the paper are describe how data analysis workflows are really performed. Um, provide principles on how to design your own workflow, tease apart the difference between that software and design workflows and highlight the useful principles that can be borrowed from the software workflows. Um, have it be a tool and language agnostic and define and put this terminology we keep throwing out into context. And I apologize that I don't go into definitions of all the terminology I'm using. I want you to please go to the paper where you like bold everything and we have a whole terminology list to make it a little easier for beginners to approach this type of work. So we developed the ERP data analysis workflow system. So the ERP is explore, refine, and polish. Um, and that's named after the three defined phases of a research project that, it, that um, we see during a workflow. Um, so this is a, the main figure of the paper and I'm gonna kind of tease it apart a little bit so I can explain the, the research products. So the ERP data analysis workflow, um, we propose that it can be defined, a workflow can be defined and informed by a series of decisions represented by this tree here. So the standards of reproducibility, that's documentation, organization, code structure, um, this is really a spectrum and it becomes more stringent as the project evolves. And each decision can result in several outcomes throughout the whole lifetime of the project, including dead ends, interesting avenues that might be on beyond the scope of your project, but also research projects that I'm focusing on today. So the key to the ERP workflow is that these design decisions and the movement through the phases is largely determined by two things. Your immediate audience, who you're communicating your research to, and the research products that you are creating. So I'm going to just quickly go through the phases here and again go to the paper where we describe this a little bit more detail and, and we'll have, we provide questions to ask yourself while going through through designing a workflow. But in the exploratory phase this is the phase where everything's really messy and you're kind of trying one data 
trying something, one data thing, trying to see if your data fits into this tool or that tool and just being really creative in the process. And this is also where you hit a lot of dead ends. Um, and the median audience here is yourself or your future self. So you may not need to carefully document and carefully make everything reproducible because a lot of the stuff you're gonna leave in the end. I'm not saying that those, those pieces aren't important, but you don't have to be perfect in your organization and reproducibility that early on when you're exploring. The refinement phase, your audience is your small team. And in academia, this is usually your lab setting or maybe uh, another student who you're working on the project with, who you share data. Um, and the standards of this is what you do with your team. And this is where data management plans come into, come into play. So the last is the polishing phase. And this is your audience is your community. Um, so the research products of the polishing phase all happen throughout the entirety of the thing. And it's in this L shape. Um, so our, each community has different standards and norms. And you may be part of a lot of communities. Um, but these communities are at your mind when you're polishing up uh, research products for uh, consumption against your wider community beyond your small team. So the key point of the polishing phase is research products can emerge at any time during the life cycle of a research project. We have to stop thinking about at the end, we're going to do this traditional research paper and that's when everything's going to come out. Things that help you can emerge at any point in the life cycle of a research project. So the decision to put effort into these research products can be defined by two motivations, and that's getting credit for your work and gaining skills for your next career stage. A third one that I didn't main, mention here is to support reproducible research. And that's like that lot, this pink line that runs throughout. Maybe you have a research product that supports that reproducibility and then that makes it important. But really when you're going through your project phase, you think to yourself, what do I need to get to my next career stage? If you're not gonna wanna be a professor, maybe creating a package or a library is more important than putting it all into the research or maybe creating a tutorial or bumping up your GitHub profile is gonna be more valuable if you wanted to go to industry. So I'm just going to quickly go through a few of the research projects that can products that can emerge. Um, so in this exploratory phase, the quote "one person's trash is another person's treasure" is really valuable here. So don't just leave things. If you've taken the time to make notes, wrap them up and put them into a blog post or um, a white paper. Uh, dead ends can warn others if communicated correctly the, per the perils of certain analyses, what tools worked, what tools didn't. Maybe you spent the time to learn a tool and you might not use it in the research product, but get it out there, make it part of the documentation for that open source tool. Um, off scope research results, maybe they're beyond the scope of the project you're working on, but save those and document them and they can be used for grant proposals. And of course, clean data is valuable, publish it. What you learn can be so much great help for others. So create tutorials, anything that you put work into throughout that whole life plan, get credit for it, put it out there. You spent the time to learn it. You spent the time to make notes on it, get it out there and help you. Um, yes, yeah, so the exploratory phase is when, with your team. So the data management plans, these are now publishable, publishable products and can be used in grant proposals. Um, and they can be reused on your team to make every a tight, data management plan that works in your small team. Uh, analysis notebooks, and then small tools in the forms of scripts. So say you create a really small tool that just converts one data type to another. Package it up correctly, get it out there, get it on GitHub, get credit for it. Even before the paper is published, just do it all, all the time. So I just have a few main takeaways. Um, a research project, success is more than the traditional peer-reviewed paper. And we have to get this out. And I'm sure this has been repeated throughout all of these sessions. It's, it's more than a traditional research paper, peer-reviewed paper. Standards are defined by your community. So it's up to you and your community to define these standards. We need to be having a lot more conversations about what are our standards for our community. Even what are our standards for our team? We need to stop just talking about results and talk about 
standards for reproducibility, standards for data standards to share the data. We just need to be talking about it more. Um, and then alternative research projects, products are more than just the product themselves. They act as a guide for your data analysis workflow. So they help you design how to be reproducible and they allow you to get that credit and get new school, gain new skills that'll help you on your next step of your career. So again, the most important research questions in modern science, I believe, um, currently lie on large research teams and reproducible workflows are really the backbone of how researchers learn to work together. Therefore, we need to better define and teach how to design them to ourselves, but also to our next generation of researchers. So I just want to acknowledge Sarah Stout and Valerie Vasquez, who are the co-authors of this paper, um, Stuart Geiger, and the best, who uh, led the best practices in data science working group at BIDS, which uh, is a fantastic group. And a lot of these conversations happened within that group. Rebecca Barta for her very thoughtful feedback and edits of the paper. And then of course, BIDS, Berkeley Institute for Data Science, who brought all of us together. So feel free to contact me uh, on any of this. I love talking about it and we're currently revising the paper. So if you have anything that's confusing in here, let me know. And that's it. Great, thank you so much, Sierra. That was a very interesting talk. Um, as a former researcher that switched careers to become a librarian, I just love the idea of getting credit for your work as you go through your research career and using that to better position yourself for potential career changes in the future. Um, does anybody have any questions for Sierra? Uh, you can raise your hand, throw them in the chat. I'll just give us a minute so people can type. Okay, we have a question from Brian. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, Sierra, thanks for that talk. It was really helpful. And I felt um, like I could really relate to that. So I kind of went through that process in grad school of um, taking time to document some of the um, sort of like specialized hardware that I had um, developed and in some ways it paid off in, in, in totally unpredictable fashion, but I would say that it's really difficult to sometimes explain the reason for spending so much time on these things to faculty, um, especially like established faculty. I, so I wonder if you have any advice on um, how you best have conversations with mentors or advisors about making the time and sort of being encouraging of the time for working on some of these other uh, documenting processes. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think that's what I hope changes the most and kind of why we wrote this paper also is mentors have to realize that these alternative research products are important to the career development beyond someone wanting to be a professor. But yeah, they're paying you. They want you to get research done. Um, so the main thing I can say is if they really are into you not spending time with it, you kind of meet them halfway and take advantage of all the new open source community that's kind of uh, structuring behind this, which is publish them in a paper, publish that data management plan in the paper, publish that tool in a paper, get their name on these things that are now very easily publishable as a paper. Um, and then it's a back and forth. Your career and is at the top of what needs to be done, whether you're being a professor or you're a grad student and taking that extra time to like well document a tool some people won't want to spend the time doing that and that's okay they just want to get to the paper i mean it's not okay for the reproducibility aspects but if you want to do that and you want to gain those skills you got to fight <laughs> to spend that time and i 
I think now it's become such a big topic on research incentives and career um, options within research that I think you can point, hopefully you can point the read the mentor or ask those questions as you're entering graduate school while you're picking a PI. It, they need to value, you guys have to be on the same page in the value system, but yeah, it's a really tricky topic that I hope, that's the main thing I hope changes is how students are mentored. <laughs> Great, thank you, Sierra. Um, we had a comment from Alex I just wanna share, said the graphic is so great, I can't wait to show it to my department. Um, one of the graphics in the talk. And there's another question, but I'm gonna actually save it for the panel because I think it's possibly something that um, Carrie and Justin would wanna weigh in as well. So I will just ask uh, Carrie and Justin to rejoin us for our panel discussion. Normally we would have you um, come to the front and sit in these bar stools we have for our panel discussion when it happens in the Mellon Library in Pittsburgh, but here we're just on our virtual stage today. Okay, so I am going to let Ali unmute themselves and pose the question to the group. Not gonna get away from it, am I? <laughs> Um, hi, Sierra. Uh, so my question was originally directed at Sierra, but it's actually a good question for all of the panel. Um, for, for data professionals, for those of us who are sort of in a research support role um, for a variety of different kinds of research, how would you suggest we go about helping the researchers who take one look at this stuff and freak out and go, I have no idea where to even, in other words, the bigness of it is overwhelming to them. And if we could maybe give them a little bite-sized piece, um, maybe it would help, but I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on where the entry points might be. Uh, go ahead, Justin. <laughs> I was going to say, in case Gary is too modest to say it, send him to a carpentry's workshop. That would be my first recommendation. Um, it's a great on-ramp uh, for people with, with uh, just at the beginning of the journey, I think. Um, I, I've seen that many times. Um, from the reproducibility side, I would also just mention that there happens to be a chapter in the book um, which you can find, which goes through like the simplest possible reproducible workflow we could think of. Um, so you could also have a glance at that. And in fact, it was a lesson I wrote for a carpentry's workshop at one point, which later became a chapter in the book. So there you have it. Thank you, Justin. It, it's true, but one of the things that we teach really is to teach the most useful thing first. And I think it can be difficult to bite an entire elephant. Um, and we want to show people that if you learn how to do one thing, you can learn how to do the next. So I would try to identify a problem that they're trying to solve with their research and show them how to do one thing. So for example, we, we even do this on our staff. We send lots of emails and someone on our team showed us all how to write a very short script that would send a hundred emails at once so that we wouldn't have to do the whole copy paste copy paste and for a few individuals on the team who had never done programming before that literally just opened their mind to wow i can automate this and i don't have to sit here for hours and look through everything so i, I would say ask them where are their pain points what is the most irritating part or the most frustrating part of the work that you do and see if there is a way you can show them how to do one thing, whether it's using programming or, or whatever that looks like to show them that it's not, it's going to be useful because I think that's one of the things that frustrates people about programming, just like it used to frustrate people about calculus um, is when am I ever gonna use this? But if you can show them something that's extremely useful that could save them time, that could save them pain, I think that's where they would get excited about learning programming. Yeah, and to add on that, I think 
it's all about pieces. So your goal should never be a, to have a 100% reproducibility project. Your goal should be to gain those reproducibility skills. So every time you learn a new strategy, it's getting 10% closer, getting 5% closer. We need to just rebrand what reproducibility. It's never 100%. No one ever achieves 100%. It's just like you do something and you should get the satisfaction that you are doing better every time you approach it. Great, thank you. I love that point about um, it not being 100%, but just any movement in that direction is really beneficial. Um, we have a question from Alex that is mostly for Carrie. So um, Alex, if you'd like to go ahead and unmute yourself, I'll just let you ask that question yourself. Uh, sure. Uh, sorry, it took me a second to unmute. Um, uh, yesterday um, at the Sister Symposium um, on uh, AI for data reuse, um, Ken Codinger gave uh, from the Open Learning Project gave this great talk on how they're using data to improve instructional design. And it like struck me that the Carpentries have made many similar insights to what had emerged from their research and that you're a data-friendly project. And I wondered if you'd ever considered a collaboration with them, um, which could then benefit all the rest of us. <laughs> that would be amazing. We, we had not um, spoken with them about a collaboration, but I, you know, as executive director, one thing that I try my best to do is not reinvent things or start things from scratch when I know that there are those out there who are doing it successfully already or that we can you know, come together and build something even stronger. So I would love it if I could get that, just con if you have the contact information or even a link to their website so that I could reach out because we're often um, digging into the research to make sure that our instructor training curriculum is up to date and you know, figuring out ways to improve our curriculum and our programming and so data-driven research is what we're all about. And I would love to reach out to them. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, they might also probably benefit from uh, some of the sort of more social insights that you're providing and ways to think about how to incorporate that into their model as well. I mean, I just feel like, I don't know, I'm not involved with their project. I just am seeing the, the synergy between the two things and thinking that could be a really powerful collaboration. Thank you, thank you. It sounds like we're meant to be. Yes, thank you for bringing that up, Alex. I've used um, OLI in my teaching at CMU. And like I said, I'm a huge fan of the Carpentries and host Carpentries workshops all the time. And there is indeed, I think, some good synergy there. Um, do we have any other questions? Am I missing any? We have a few more minutes. Um, so just throw a hand up. Or did anybody else have anything else to add? Okay, it looks like we have. Um, okay. This takes me a while to sift through all this. Okay, well, we're waiting. I'm also going to put in. A, oh, do you have a question, Washin? Oh, no, no. I got disconnected for a moment, so I wasn't sure if my message came through. I was just saying, like, I'm, I'm happy to connect you and Ken. I'm sure he'll be happy to collaborate. That's a great point from the audience. Um, and again, we have a few more minutes for questions. So while we're waiting here, I'm also just going to put in another plug for the Carpentries. Um, it's come up a lot in this session. Um, if you are in Pittsburgh and you are interested in getting involved with the Carpentries, um, we are always looking for helpers at our workshops. Um, and that could be a great way for you to come and check out a workshop and see what it's about. And we also often have seats available for instructor training. Um, so again, we always welcome people in the Pittsburgh community um, to join our CMU Carpentries community. Um, and so just get in touch if that sounds like it's of interest to you. Um, and we'll be holding them virtually this year. So it'll be interesting. <laughs>
Okay. I am not seeing any more questions. Um, if you do think of questions, you can feel free to put them in the Slack. And so I just wanna thank our speakers again from session four. Uh, your talks went really well together, <laughs> better than I could have predicted even. Um, so it was really great to have the three of you join us. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And I agree. Our, our talks flow very, very well. We should create a series and go on the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me and great organizing putting us all together. Okay, so um, we are going to have our closing remarks start in just a few minutes. Um, but before that, I just have a couple more announcements. Um, I will direct you all to the Slack channel again. We will be putting a survey in there. So we'd really appreciate any feedback people have from either this event or the ADAR event yesterday. Also, um, earlier in the day, Sarah Kaiden got a lot of questions that we didn't have time for. She was talking about openness in internet policy and building equity. Um, so she has gone into the Slack and answered all the questions we didn't get to. So thank you so much to her for doing that. And so you just have to scroll up um, in the OSS channel a bit. That thread was started around 1 p.m. But she has some um, answers in there for those questions that we didn't get a chance to get to.